Okay, everybody close your eyes. (laughs) Some of you are so unsubmissive. (laughs) My goodness. If if you can't follow that instruction, what are you going to do when God says to look in the mirror and he wants you to change something? (laughs) Everybody, man, everybody. (laughs) You you kids. (laughs) With your eyes closed, I'm not close enough to bite you, so chill, okay? (laughs) With your eyes closed, what do you see? You don't even see the back of your eyelids. (laughs) It's what it was like for this man who was born blind, could see nothing. Now, this gentleman, incidentally, we believe wasn't born blind, but something happened to blind him. Otherwise, how would he know that they were trees and how would he describe men as looking like trees that were walking because he had seen previously. And maybe that's why he had these friends. See, I'm giving you all an opportunity with your eyes closed, you could fall asleep right now and some of you just can't handle it. (laughs) If you're going to have your eyes open, just don't look at me. This, this man had friends who brought him to Jesus. That's incredible. Because you see, anybody who was blind, especially if you got blind after birth, that meant you obviously had sinned. You were somebody else. And you were practically as untouchable as a leper. You didn't have to holler out to the crowd, leper, I'm a leper, I'm a leper. But you weren't really welcome because you were blind, and obviously something was wrong with you. So you can open your eyes. And think about that, man, as we go through uh, the, the message this morning, as we look at Mark, the eighth chapter. And does anyone remember how long ago we started the study of the Gospel of Mark? What did you say? I do. <laughs> Four weeks? <laughs> yeah, it been, it, it's been uh, over a year ago. <laughs> and then we did, uh, we took some breaks. We had to go into some other things. We, we had something called Christmas, and so we kind of did a little divergence there, and we had vacation Bibles. So there's different experiences along the way. Uh, and then we had our covenanting signing time in January. But but now we're, we're back into, and, and it's interesting, here we are following up Easter, we want to learn how to make disciples and how to become disciples of Jesus Christ, how to become stronger followers of him. And we, like the blind man, need to see Jesus more clearly. We need to get a better view of him. And it's not just here on Sunday morning, but when we're out there so that we can follow him Fully and be truly a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. In Mark 8, 22 to 26, it says, They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. In other words, don't go to town, don't tell him what happened. We'll touch on that in a moment. This place called Bethsaida, where this man is from, is a place that we've actually seen before. And if I think this is a map, can any of you read any of those words? So can you see in the middle of it that there is a, a lake? That's, that's called the Sea of Galilee, okay, Blue Lake. Uh, if you look there, uh, you'll, you'll get an idea. Jordan River comes down to the south. Uh, I've taken that off of the map, it's, but, but that whole line that comes out of the Sea of Galilee is Jordan River. The Jordan River is fed by three springs up from the north, one of which is up by a place that used to be known for Pan, uh, 
and it's called Paneus. It's a and Pan was a was a god, a Roman god, and there were all kinds of um, temples that were built cut into the rock. They even believed there's a the, the water that starts the Jordan River comes out of a spring that's underground and they would actually throw people down into this cavern believing that if they um, saw blood come out, well, that means that Pan had accepted their sacrifice. And if not, well, too bad for you. And this was the place near the base of Mount Hermon the place where we believe Jesus had the Holy Spirit reveal Elijah and Moses to him. Amazing location. It's in this this setting. Uh, Hazor's up there at the northern part. That's up from Chorazin and from Capernaum. And you see Bethsaida is over on the the far eastern eastern shore. Uh, And actually, the word Bethsaida means house of fish. House of fish. Now, don't confuse that with the pool that's referred to as the pool of Bethesda and sometimes also called the pool of Bethsaida. That's a pool that's literally right outside the temple, off the temple mount, and that was a place. And that, incidentally, pool of Bethesda means house of mercy. House of many fish, that's because this was a fishing town. And do you know who grew up there? Well, John 1, says that Philip, like Andrew and Peter, were from the town of Bethsaida. Wow, pretty significant town then, isn't it? If you think about it, up there to the west of Bethsaida is Capernaum. Capernaum is where Peter's mother-in-law was from, and Jesus spent quite a lot of time in Capernaum. You think about some of the miracles that took place around this area. Just to the west of Capernaum is where Jesus fed the 5,000. In Bethsaida, you might remember that he actually um, heals this blind man. Uh, In fact, the centurion was from this community. The centurion who said, my servant's sick and hey, but I'm a man under authority and I understand that you've got authority so you speak and he'll be healed and he gets back home and the man's healed. This is also right outside the community where you remember a lady named the widow of Nain? Nain's right there by Bethsaida and she actually had her only son on a stretcher. He had died and they were taking him off to bury him. And scripture tells us that Jesus was moved with compassion, reaches out and touches the beer, this, this um, uh, con- cart stretcher that's holding this uh, woman's son. It says I, he had compassion, he touches that beer and the man sits up. <laughs> Imagine being at a funeral gathering like that and seeing him just sit up and, and Jesus gives him back to his mom. That's what's happening right there. The miracles that took place in this area of Israel is just incredible. Hold on to that thought and remember that and let's go on just a little bit because in Luke 10, 13 it, and Matthew eleven twenty one it says, Woe to you, Chorazin. See where Chorazin is? Woe to you, Bethsaida. Uh-oh. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Incidentally, this is an area that is um, both uh, whoops, Gentile and, and Jews are living in this area. A lot of Jews, but as you start head towards Hazor, it becomes almost totally Gentile area. And this, as we talked about last week on the western, eastern side there, is what we would refer to today as the Golan Heights. And there are many Gentiles that were living over there. And Jesus will take, go from the coast out here where Tyre and Sidon are, and he'll go across from the, for about a six-month period, just peaking with the disciples. That's what Jesus has been doing and will continue to do as he's teaching them. But notice what, what Jesus said. He says, I want you to come outside the town. Do you get why Jesus didn't want to deal with the blind man in the town? In fact, Jesus himself is avoiding Bethsaida. He's also going to avoid Chorazin. He's also going to avoid Capernaum. And why? Because of the text that I just read a few moments ago. Jesus has put his own curse on them. You are going to go. You're going to dissolve. You're going to be nothing. 
and it's going to be worse for you than it was for Tyre, than it would be for Tyre and Sidon, than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because you have ordered all these incredible miracles. You've seen all these wonderful things with your own eyes. 5,000 of you, which means probably 20,000 of them, had actually been fed by the feeding of the bread and the fish and experienced that kind of a miracle. Some more of them, with the feeding of the 4,000, had also been fed last week on the other side of the lake. All kinds of people have been blessed and seen incredible miracles. People raised from the dead like the son of the lady from Nain. People that have been healed miraculously by all different kinds of means. He says, look, you've seen all of this and yet you don't believe. Yet you don't believe. And so Jesus isn't going in there. Now Jesus does do something like I did with the children, didn't he? He takes the hand of the man and he walks him outside away from the city. And a couple things I think that Jesus is doing there, he's showing some respect for this man. He doesn't want him to be in the middle of a crowd and a whole bunch of people watching and all. He just wants to be with him. And then what's he going to do? By the way, pretend you have a cut on your finger. What's your next move right now? You just got a cut on your little, on your, your index finger. What are you going to do? Right? You cut your finger, what are you going to do? Why'd you do that? Cannibal. <laughs> Blood eaters. <laughs> oh, that's where the movie's all coming from today, huh? <laughs> okay, you vampires. So, <laughs> see, even you believe that there's some healing in your saliva. And they clearly believed it. Had a, con had a sense that saliva was healing. So Jesus does what to this man? Spits in his eye. <laughs> Okay, now, now notice it didn't say spits in his face. <laughs> okay, but he put spit in his eye. I don't know how he did it. And you know, a man who was blind like this probably has his, his eyes are all caked up. Maybe they've been putting stuff on it. You would not believe some of the weird things they did to try to heal people back then. With blood of an animal or something else that they'd pour on it, dung and all that. I mean, it was nasty stuff that they do. And supposedly these things were supposed to heal. <laughs> Okay, so, so I, I don't know how Jesus did this. Maybe spit right there in his eyes and he's going to wipe it off. And it's no wonder the guy couldn't see. <laughs> and so, but Jesus takes him aside, holds him by his hand, puts spit in his eye, which, would, which the man would have what? Felt. And I think this is really significant, we take note of this, is that, that Jesus takes this man by his hand. Didn't I tell you earlier that a blind person is almost as unclean as a leper? So when Jesus takes this man and starts guiding him, what's he doing him touching a man who's not been touchable? You see, if you touch this man, you can't go to the temple. If you touch this man, you surely can't do any kind of religious work because you're unclean. And now you've got to go through all kinds of ritual cleansings yourself. But Jesus takes this man and says, you're clean enough for me to touch you. Isn't that, isn't that just a, a beautiful image for us of Jesus and the way he shows respect to us? Jesus comes and touches us. Uh, I, again and again when I work with a couple who's struggling in their marriage and you know, you know one of the classic lines is well I've fallen out of love so you're saying you slipped and that's how you met her and loved her and now you slipped again and you just, now, now you don't love her folks love's not a feeling it's a, it's a decision it's a commitment that you make and so one of the things that I challenge people to do who are struggling in their relationship and their love is touch the person that they love Guys, it's not a sexual touch. It's a touch of respect and intimacy and kindness. And so I'll actually say to the one who's maybe struggling, I don't feel it anymore. Well, good, start feeling it. You walk up to that person you love, just touch them on the shoulder and say, I love you, God bless you. Amen. Little touch. Because we as humans, have you noticed how we appreciate touch? You take an autistic child, you touch them. Now, you got to be careful sometimes because sometimes they don't like it. <laughs> okay? But then there's other times that the touch is really special for them. And touch is something that they're very sensitive to and that's why they don't always like it. So you got to use wisdom. But touch matters. Jesus touches the man. But then he also takes his saliva and he uses this healing agent. That's going to communicate something to this man too. Because this man knows that his friends have brought him to Jesus to be healed. And so he, he touches the man with this saliva and puts that on his eyes. And then what's the next thing he do, does? 
Now he touches his eyes after he's put the spit on them and then he prays. Now look at all these things that are happening. Kindness, respect, touch, showing grace and value, touch that says you matter, touch that just blesses us. Folks, I just want to remind you some of the best things you can do for somebody is not necessarily say anything to them. How many of you touched somebody's hand this morning? Has anybody not been touched this morning? <laughs> and so what should we do? <laughs> thanks for buying the breakfast for me the other day. I promised I'd be to church. I know. Thanks for coming, too. <laughs> we, because, see, look. And please, that's not, about, that's not about a show. That's about no one should be able to come in here and not somehow feel the touch of kindness, the touch of respect, the touch of a welcome, the touch of I care. That's what Jesus is doing for this man, touching him. And then it says that he, as he prays for him, then the man opens his eyes and, and he's able to actually see but not completely, is he? Incidentally, you might want to just take note. Does God do it the same time, same way all the time? No, he doesn't. If anything you learn from watching him and all of his miracles, they're constantly different. One time he says, well, your, your son's healed. Go find him. <laughs> Another time he says, bring him to me. Another time he speaks right there. Another time he says, who touched me? Another time he touches them. Another time, I mean, there are all kinds of different things that, and ways that God does his miracles. So don't put Jesus in a box. Don't put God in a, in a box of expectation. God wants to open our eyes, friends. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. Here's the fact. There's not a single person here who's become a believer in Jesus Christ who did it on your own. Oh yeah, I did. I searched the scriptures. I read all kinds of books. I talked to all kinds of people. I went to a sermon and I walked forward and accepted Jesus. It was all me. <laughs> who wrote the book? <laughs> who called you to read? who challenged you to listen, who spoke to your heart, who helped you to see what you didn't believe, what you wanted to reject, who opened up your soul. By what grace did you receive Jesus Christ? By his, not yours. That's what Paul says. Psalm 146, 8 says, The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. It's the Lord who makes it possible, friends, for us to see. I, I need to take an aside just for a moment. Do you, do you remember the conversation of John the Baptist? He's about to die. He's been arrested by Herod because he pointed out that Herod shouldn't be living, shouldn't have married his brother's wife, that that's adultery, and Herod doesn't like it, so Herod's going to end up having him killed because of a whole other sexual temptation that we'll go leave alone now. But, but so John the Baptist sends this message through his disciples. He says, um, go to Jesus and ask him if he's the one who is to come. John's doubting. Well, understandable. John has spent his life preparing for the Messiah. Dad told him many a time about what happened in the temple. You're supposed to prepare the way of the Lord, son. And, and John's remembered that, and he's been doing that in his crazy kind of way out there with the eating the locusts and the honey and, and in sackcloth and all kinds of stuff. And he's out there in the wilderness, and he's calling people to repent. And he's had that amazing moment when Jesus came down, and, and just like God had told him, the Spirit of God would descend upon the Messiah like, the, like a dove. And he heard the voice of God saying, this is my son. I'm well pleased with him. And John is excited by that, and he starts sending his disciples, you follow follow him because that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's time for me to become less and him to become greater. So you go follow him. And now he's about to die. And it's not going to be pretty. And he's like, what if I missed it? What if I didn't get it straight? And Jesus is, guess where? Bethsaida. 
at the time of the conversation outside Capernaum. And John sends his disciples and, and says, um, hey, are, are, are you the one who is to come? And Luke 7 says, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? In verse 22, Jesus replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. And then take note of what he says. The proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus says this, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Where have you heard that before? Think back on Isaiah, the 61st ch first chapter. <laughs> The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, what does that sound like? Sounds like what Jesus quoted when he's standing in the temple, at Na excuse me, at the synagogue of Nazareth, and he's telling his neighbors, listen, and look what Luke 4 says. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it. And you got to figure he didn't unroll all 53 chapters to get to this spot. <clears throat> he unrolls right there because that's where God had already ordained for it to be read. He unrolls to this spot, and this is what he reads. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to, the, to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And John's wondering, are you the Messiah? Are you the one I was preparing for? I haven't seen you doing anything political yet. Because here's what the Messiah is supposed to do. Heal, set people free, comfort the mourning, come alongside of an earth that is hurting and give them life. And what has been proclaimed is happening in front of you, John. Yes, I am the one. And if you were to imagine the map, hello. <laughs> if you were to imagine the map back up there again, <laughs> look at that. Good imagination, kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. <laughs> so on the map up there, you'll see Capernaum again is at the upper end of the lake and Bethsaida is over here to the right. And here's where Jesus is heading now. He's heading up towards Hazor. He's leaving Bethsaida and as he leaves, and again, he avoided these towns. He said, I'm not going in there. I've cursed them. They've seen the miracles and they haven't believed. And I'm moving on. And as he's walking away, he turns to the disciples and he says, who do they say that I am? Who do the people say I am? So let's go back to Mark 8, verse 27 and following. <clears throat> Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you 
are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. <clears throat> Who do people say that I am? Some say John the Baptist. He just died not that long ago. But weren't you guys together at the same place? So that'd be kind of weird. You must be Elijah, Elijah the prophet. He, Elijah, he's, he did miracles just like you've done. And, and so maybe you're Elijah come back from the dead. Or, or just one of the prophets. I mean, you speak with a, such authority. And we haven't heard a prophet for 400 years. And so maybe you're just one of the prophets, someone that we don't know. We're not really sure. The people don't know who he is. Who do people say that Jesus is today? <laughs> What's a hippie? <laughs> Long-haired Jesus freak, right? <laughs> Listen to this. The Muslim says that Jesus was a prophet. But he was not crucified on a cross. He will return, but he is not God. That's in the Quran. The Hindu believes that Jesus is one of a million gods. And by the way, in, in Hindu cult religion, you can have more gods. You know, just create another one. The Jew believes that Jesus was a great prophet and teacher. Not God. The Mormon believes that Jesus was the first baby born to God in heaven. And when God in a physical body had sexual intercourse with Mary his own daughter, and that he is the spirit brother of Lucifer. That's Mormonism. And I'm just saying, they all have some pieces, but they also have some pretty wrong stuff. The Jehovah Witness believe that Jesus was once the archangel Michael before he came to the earth. In their view, Jesus is not God in the flesh. The atheist denies that Jesus ever existed at all. The agnostic just doesn't know what to believe about Jesus. And society believes that Jesus was a great teacher, that he had some good ideas about loving your fellow man and being good to others, but they do not believe that he is the Savior or that he is God in the flesh. Most people acknowledge his existence, but they refuse to bow to his authority or give him the worship he deserves. And what about you? C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity, says we have to be really careful of saying, well, Jesus is a good teacher. Let me quote. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, meaning Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice, Lewis says. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. So as Jesus walks with the disciples and they've described all these different people and, and how the people are describing who Jesus is, then he asks the most important question. I've been with you for two and a half years. I've taught you, I've walked with you, I've slept beside you, I've fed you, you've experienced miracles. I've walked on the water in front of you, I've calmed stor storms right before your eyes. I've healed the sick, the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, deaf are hearing. People have come back to life right in front of your eyes, guys. Who do you 
say that I am. I wonder what it was like in that moment. I wonder if Peter just like, you know, I know the answer, I know the answer, over here, over here, there are my hands here, can you see me, Jesus, I know the answer. I don't think it was that way either. I wonder if they all just kind of, is this a trick question? <laughs> Who's going first on this one? I wonder if we know. And Peter says, you're the Christ. You are the Christ. You are the anointed Messiah. Christ, Messiah, means literally anointed one. Jesus, we've watched you. We've experienced the miracles. We've seen what you've done. We get it, Jesus. You're the Messiah. And the way, is it Matthew who records it? He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Oh, this is news, folks. This is a deeper understanding. This is an incredible revelation. This is a profound concept that Peter has gotten a hold of and the disciples have gotten a hold of it. But why do you think this all happened right after a guy was healed of blindness, only not completely? Incidentally, did you catch that? Jesus heals the man. He says, you know, spits on him, lays his hands on him, and he says, okay, now what do you see? And, and, and the guy says, well, I, 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 it's like trees, like men walking. And so, okay, you're not seeing very clearly, are you? <laughs> and what does Jesus do? Wow, Jesus isn't very thorough, is he? I mean, how come he didn't heal him the first time? Is it possible that Jesus is trying to teach a lesson by the healing of this blind man? And that the lesson has something to do with our eyesight? Who do you see? Do you see that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? And do you see it clearly? Or are you just seeing kind of like this? It looks, uh, Jesus, you look like a tree walking. I mean, I sort of get who you are, but not totally. Do you see who the Son of God is? You're the anointed one. Peter makes this statement. He says, and if you think about this, what's Jesus saying? You are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the word that became flesh. You are the word that created everything in the beginning of time. You existed before everything and you will exist ever after everything. By your very word, by your presence, heavens and earth came into existence. You're the king of kings. You're the firstborn of all creation. No one has existed before you. Jesus, you are that living word that gives life to us. Jesus, you're the savior of the world. Jesus, you are the Messiah. And how did it happen? Matthew says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. How did Peter get it? The same way any one of us would get it. By the spirit and power of God that made it possible for us to understand and to believe. Colossians says it this way. And Paul's praying for the Colossian church. He says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God. What's the mystery of God? What's this incredible thing that God has done that's so mysterious? It's so hard for us to comprehend. The mystery is, and here's the other way he says it, namely, Christ. The mystery is the Messiah. The mystery is Jesus Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And Paul goes on. And he makes a statement to you and me. Verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. It is the most important question. And it's a question that needs to influence the way we live every day. 
who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Is he the Christ for you? Is he just a good teacher? Thank you. And it's hard because I believe in him and because I've seen him, but blessed are you who haven't seen him but believe. And believe. I really had to get more time with that because I feel like I should believe, you know, extraordinary for I don't really. <laughs> and see what Jesus wants for us is to see even more than that that he is the Christ. So he helps us to see beyond our blindness, beyond our limited view of him, and we all have a limited view of him. The danger of a wonderful moment like that is to leave him just standing there. Peace be with you. Because what Jesus wants to become is Lord of your life. And that makes that vision incredible that Jesus become the living Lord of your life. So who do you say that Jesus is? Let's pray. Every person here has heard about you, Jesus heard the many different stories and experiences, the miracles and incredible things that, that, that were done by you and in your name. But we could easily become like Bethsaida and Chorazin and Capernaum. We could see all these things, experience a miracle, just like that vision, and yet 